مرغ باغ ملکوتم مرغ باغ ملکوتم نیم از عالم خاک دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخت اند از بدنم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان شاء الله we'll continue with the uh, the ghazal from volume 1 of the uh, masnavi of mevlana uh, and you'll recall that it is essentially taking the form of a poetic meditation on the famous hadith inna li rabbikum fi ayami dahrikum nafahat ala fata'arradu laha your lord has in the days of his time exhalations, breathings, moments of blessings, so expose yourselves to them. And we've now reached uh, verse number four, which runs as follows. Nafhaye digar rasid aga bash, ta azin hamva na mani khajatash. Another breath or a further breath has arrived, nafhaye digar. So be alert, Aga. And don't miss this one either, master of the house. So he's begun by speaking of this spring-like breath which gives life to the soul. And we saw ways in which that is an evolution of Quranic teaching. And we spent a little bit of time talking about the nafasa rahman, the, the breath, the exhalation of the all-compassionate as uh, a particular way or a code, if you like, for explaining the mystery of being itself. And now he's talking about a second exhalation. And what could that be if the world is nothing other than the necessarily uninterrupted, merciful breathing of the all-compassionate? Uh, then what is the second? Well, what he's speaking about here uh, in the eyes of the commentators, is a uh, revelation. Being is its own disclosure in a certain way. It's already clear. The unclarity, the obscurity, rests in the human observer, not in the nature of existence itself. The problem is within, not without. It is inner work that we need to do in order to trigger this, uh, this epistemology, this uh, type of knowledge, this way of knowing, uh, it is not by tinkering with being. Being itself is already perfect. The world is kamil, necessarily. So what we need to do in order to apprehend that perfection uh, is to uh, experience or realize perfection, kamal, in ourselves and to become insani kamil, a perfect human being. Uh, So being is unveiled but we are veiled from being, and that veil is not a constituent of being. The veil is part of our own fiery, lower, passional nature. And uh, all of this, the human predicament, will be uh, unpacked for us by Medlana in uh, later uh, lines in this, in this ghazal. The commentators say that the first breath is being itself, which necessarily discloses itself fully. There's no order of creation that could be described as a veil that um, obscures meaning, form, content, the the ontology of being. It's necessarily manifest. But there is also a sense in which uh, the human being responds more to the divine name of al-Batin than the name al-Zahir. Allah is hidden hidden not from himself, not from reality, not in reality. The Zahir is always Zahir. The Batin reflects ourselves. It's about our nature. It's about our percipients of things. And so as well as the first nafha, the first exhalation, which is being itself, which is itself its own explanation, there has to be another breath which enables us to lift the veil or 
more precisely, as Rumi will explain, to show that that veil is just a kind of false perception, a point of view, uh, a misapprehension. So we need to learn, and a different kind of process, therefore, needs to be part of creation, as well as the permanent, eternal, glowing, luminous now of the divine mazhar, manifestation in being, there needs also to be something in creation that enables us in our fiery, veiled nature to perceive that. And how it is that being could be veiled from itself is, is one of the mysteries that the people of this path constantly discuss. So the first veil, the first breath is that which is remembered, that which remembers itself. And the second breath is that which triggers within ourselves the due remembrance of, of how things are. In other words, you could say it's about uh, metaphysics and about prophecy. If you want to use, it a, kind of, to use a kind of kalam uh, division here, you could say uh, la ilaha illallah is the first breath the necessary apparatic, perfect, self-referential statement of how it is. And the second is Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad the Messenger of God. So the paradox of our situation is that surrounded by things that are nothing other than unmediated, perfect signs of their nature and source, we need a lot of help in order to read them correctly because we are illiterate. We can't read the ayat. And hence the second breath takes the form of something that is not an augmentation of creation, but is in a sense where creation is tending. It is prophecy that introduces really the meaning of time, the fact that there can be progression. Creation is already Allah's, so it's already perfect. How can time have any kind of meaningful progression? Are we waiting for anything? Is there anything to be disclosed or to take place? Well, in fact, with the second breath, Mevlana is saying there is. And the next few lines are going to be about that paradox of how perfection can, as it were, experience in its own nature an augmentation to the second breath, the second word, uh, which is actually uh, revelation itself, or the word, to use that kind of Greek logos terminology, revelation in the term of speech, in terms of how we can articulate our situation, and at the deep nature of speech, how we can be transformed, which is exactly our doctrine of the Qur'an. The surface level of the Qur'an is, is its ma'ani, and at the deep level, there's kalamullahi al-qadim, which can have its extraordinary effect even amongst people who don't happen to know Arabic don't understand a word of the outward form. And part of this tradition, and certainly the commentary tradition, and this is one uh, area in which the city of Konya and its ulama have excelled, is going deeper and deeper and deeper into the layers of uh, Allah's speech. This has always been a city of tafsir and a city of the, uh, an attempt to put into the fragile web of words something of what the sincere believer experiences when the text starts to open up to him at its deeper level, the seven deep levels of, of reading the Qur'an. So we spoke about Qunawi a couple of days ago and his I'jaz al-Bayan, his great uh, commentary on the Qur'an, uh, but there's also a strong tradition that uh, you could say existed before, but the ulama of, of Qunya were particularly fond of it, uh, which is commentaries on, on Surat al-Fatiha, uh, and we'll have more to say about that in, in due course. But very often the later Ottoman ulama, when they're interested in this kind of metaphysics, actually trying to figure out what being is and how multiplicity relates to unity, these fundamental important questions that as intellectuals they needed to, to figure out, they tended to do that in the context of commentaries on the Fatiha. Uh, and Mullah Fenari, the first uh, Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire was one of the great commentators on, on the Fatiha, Dawoodi Qaysari and many others. Very difficult, deep, esoteric interpretations. And um, they take their cue essentially from, from Sadruddin Qunawi and what he's doing with, 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 with the, the first surah. Uh, another way of expressing this using slightly Western theological terminology might be to say if there's a differentiation between the first breath and the second breath, it is to do with what's technically known as general and specific revelation. 
general revelation is that divine self-disclosure through his signs in scholastic uh, Catholicism, vestigia dei, the God that seems to be absent but has left behind himself certain signs that indicate his presence, existence, nature, qualities. And in our theology, of course, we infer abductively from signs in the created world, order, the possibility of physical constants, the reliability of mathematics, more subtle things like the human apperception of beauty, all of these things which are in the otherwise kind of chaotic gray um, plasma of being, that they indicate the existence of the one behind the many. And our entire theological project is about that discursively. And then when we go into the Kashfi Wahhabi uh, traditions, um, such as that of, of Mevlana, we find that while there is certainly a discourse that the mind can have in this, the heart also uh, is a privileged recipient of this knowledge. After all, the book, the Sukhan, the word, uh, which is the Qur'an, was sent down not upon the Prophet's mind, but nazzalahu ala qalbik. He sent it down upon your heart. And the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, at the culmination of his ascension of his prophetic career, it was his heart that saw. Ma kadab al fu'adu ma ra'a. The heart did not falsify or deny that which it saw. So this is an axiom in our tradition. Of course, there was the mind, which has formal language and can work things out within certain necessary constraints. And there is also the heart, which has the ability to move beyond that, but has disadvantages, because the heart can often be subject to emotional ecstatic states, and it needs to be regulated through formal discourse, which is often not very good at producing, which is why the kalam is the arbiter of the validity of any articulated state that comes from the heart, rather than the other way around that kalam is the arbiter, it's the qadi, over what the Sufis might, might say. Just as the sharia is the arbiter, uncontroversially, over any of the practices that they might want to engage in. Because there has to be a formal discourse, um, revelation takes the form of a formal discourse, and the outward meaning of the Qur'an always trumps and takes priority over any internal ta'wil, allegorical interpretations that might occur to the heart of an individual reader. So. The first breath, the cosmos, a perfect galaxy of signs. And the second breath, that which enables us to articulate our sense of wonder and properly to respond to the signs. So the first and the second shahadas, uh, that's what this, this, this is about. And this is kind of cosmological because both of these two breaths happen in a strange kind of way, but one which we insist on in our theology at the beginning of everything. Uh, creation, well, it begins, that, that's the beginning, in the beginning. But in the beginning also, and in this way that we insist on before the beginning, if that's not an abusive uh, use of language, uh, there is the word, the Qur'an, the speech, which is the second breath, which is Kalamullahi al Qadim. Ayatu Hakim min al Rahmani Muhtafatun Qadimatun Sifatu Mal Sufi Bil Qidami. Mambusiri says it. It's it's they've come again, Muhtafatun, but they're Qadimatun, uncreated. Their quality is as the quality of he who has no beginning. So both of these breaths are, if you like, concurrent and at the beginning. But nonetheless, as we'll see, Mevlana chants this this magnificent scenario of cosmic history in which there is still a movement, a teleology up towards perfection. There are ways in which things have an entropy and go down, as with the hadith that we looked at yesterday, khairul quruni qarni, the best of generations is my generation and things go downhill. Um, but there is also a sense in which there is a, a complementary movement which is an upwards movement um, which he'll be referring to in a couple of versus time. So that's at the beginning of time. Two breaths, and that's everything that is. At the end of time, if you read your Qur'an, you'll find that there are two blasts. This one is not referred to as nafha, which is a kind of soft jamali idea of a breathing out, a whisper almost, but nafha, which is like a blast, like a kind of fierce, um, sandy blast from a hot, arid desert. 
And this is what Israfil alayhi salam does at the end of time. وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ And the trumpet is blown. فَسَائِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And everybody in the heavens and the earth falls down in a swoon. ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامٌ يَنْظُرُونَ And then it is blown again and they stand looking. Uh, and this is significant. The two gentle breaths, breathings of the Rahman which bring the world into being and then at the end in many ways, and it's not too moralistic to say this because of the divine wrath the kind of furious ending of everything the cosmic right, that's enough of your rubbish, nafcha two things that shatter everything and knock, knock us all over and again there's a way in which as the first two parallel the first two shahad as the second uh, are paralleled by, by, by the, 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 the second are paralleled also by the two shahadas, um, which is to do, we can't spend much time on it, but is to do with the divine rigor and then the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, whose appearance is basically the only principle that's mentioned in, in our revelation that tempers successfully the divine rigor and he appears again as rahmatil lil alameen. So the cosmos begins with rahmah. Allah breathes out of his mercy and everything is wound up again through the specific second shahada manifestation of the divine rahmah in whom? In the person of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, verse number five. yaft azvaya intifa morda pushid azbagaya o ghaba. The Jani Nari, the, the, the soul of fire, the fiery soul was intifa, was extinguished by it, was put out by it. And from its eternity, the soul of the dead wore a robe of life. So there's two things going on here. He's talking about these two uh, nafhas, and now he's got on to the second one, which is the prophetic one. The fact that there is speech, that there is unveiling, there's the possibility of human perfection, that in our earthiness, from alam from the world of, of clay, we can still become the only entity in creation that can perceive and understand what's going on and can have a moral life. Uh, so what does this nafha do? The fiery soul was put out by it. And from its eternity, the soul of the dead wore a robe, wore a robe of, of, of life. Uh, it's the second breath, and again, this is a kind of poetic conceit, really, that uh, what does breath do? How do you blow out a candle? You have to blow. So the fire in the ego, Rumi is saying, this artishi jan, this kind of fiery thing that, that's within us, uh, and which is so constant, and which is ourselves. In many ways, we are our impulses and our passions and our desires and our fears, and we're, we're on fire. Uh, but it is that precisely that constitutes the veil that present, prevents us from seeing um, the fact that the first breath is still there and is taking place. So we need to put out this fire, which is kind of obscuring our vision. And one of the things, this is the implication of the poem, of the second breath, the prophetic breath, the second exhalation, is that it blows out that fire. It extinguishes it. We are the fire. We can't deal with it ourselves. Um, there has to be something from outside, and this is um, the grace, the rahmah of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rahmatan lil alamin, and rahmah consists exactly in helping us to return to our true nature as active, uh, percipient entities, khulafa, manifesting as well as recognizing Allah's beautiful names in creation, and so uh, the f and, and, and the fire is blown out. So that's the first thing that this prophetic uh, wind, Zephyr, accomplishes. And from its eternity, the soul of the dead wore a robe. Um, you, you can see what he's saying. It's, it's rather a complicated idea. The souls of the dead put on a robe. Uh, he's saying that once again, they were, their bones were brought to life. So it's a kind of image of the resurrection that the bones once again are clothed in flesh and it is in the flesh and the outward beauty that, cons that constitutes the sort of majesty, the beauty of 
of Bani Adam, sort of the beauty of human beings, is something that Rumi is constantly talking about. This is the idea of Shahid Bazi gazing upon the beauty of, of, of a human form and recognizing the, the perfection of the divine nature that has formed the human beings and recognizing also that Adam alayhi salam uh, was made uh, in his surah inna Allah khalaqa Adam ala surati and we don't anthropomorphize that to say oh well Allah must have a kind of body mm, obviously not it's talking about the divine qualities rahma, lutf Helm, Qahar, Adl, all of these divine names exist here and there in creation in various complex uh, uh, interactions, but in the Insani Kamil, in the perfected human being, they come together in due proportion. And this is the meaning of the prophetic commandment, Takhallaqu bi akhlaqillah, acquire Allah's akhlaq, his qualities obviously not in their infinity, in their perfection, in their immensity. But we know that we should be merciful because he is merciful. We know that we should be gentle because he is gentle. We know we should be just because he is just. In other words, our virtues, our values are rooted in reality. They're not the result of some kind of secular negotiation and social contract, no. The human virtues are eternal, transcendent things. They are intrinsic because they're rooted in the nature of the divine. And this, again, is fundamental to our ethical system. It has parallels, uh, particularly in, in Plato. Uh, so he's saying that we were, as it were, dead because we couldn't see um, the reality of this first nefra. Everything else in creation was blazing with light and perfection, but human beings kind of shut their eyes and uh, as it were, dead. And again, this is Quranic, uh, and this is, this is standard Islamic teaching. Those who remember their Lord, those who do not remember their Lord, are like the living and the dead. The Holy Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kal Ahya'i wal Amwat. Um, and the Quran, again, and if you look into the depths of these poems, you'll see that all of these insights and imageries are profoundly Quranic. Uh, that the Qur'an again is speaking of Allah as al-muhi wal mumit, the one who gives life and the one who gives death uh, not just in terms of our biology but in terms of the hearts so the hearts are sort of dead rotten corpses skeletons, hopeless, morgane um, mor moribund, that's how we are, we're moribund kind of half dead most of the time and Rumi is saying come to life how are you going to be alive and drink the wine of union and start dancing and be conscious of the miracle of being? It's a pretty extraordinary thing. It's not something to be sleepy about. How are you going to wake up into that state? Well, uh, that fire has to be blown out uh, and you have to have this robe conferred on you. So this is like a resurrection. Experiencing the prophetic reality is like a resurrection. It's like coming to life. Because you see in creation, through the sunnah and through your own attempt to comply with that, uh, the purpose of human creation. And that's, uh, it's only when you start to see that that you can see the purpose of creation at all. Otherwise it's just billions of light years of matter and radio stars and pulsars and great, but why, what? And that's the question the scientists leave to one side, it's not a scientific question. Once you engage with the, the miracle of a perfected human being, the one who in himself manifests these qualities, so Rumi calls uh, the Holy Prophet al-Asma'bag, the master of he taught the names, because he is the one who manifests the purpose of that, the reclamation of our Adamic possibility, truly theomorphic then you can start to see what it's all about and creation is not there just as a kind of thing that uh, an absent-minded deity did on a wet Sunday afternoon just out of interest but, but it has a purpose which is so that there can be a mirroring in creation of the perfection of the divine and thereby hangs the rest of, of, of Rumi's tale. So, moving on to bait number Six, inshallah, and here he comes. He, his, the last bit has been about this idea of the breath, 
it puts out the false life. Fire seems to be alive, but it's not. It puts that out, but it brings us to a real life. Uh, and again, here you have the idea of the bad is soba and the, the, uh, the spring breeze that after the winter puts leaves back onto trees and brings us to life. And this nafha, this divine breath, uh, as we've seen, is um, readily compared to that. Uh, and then this idea of life, uh, Mevlana brings on to what is, if you like, the most emphatic and magnificent of all Quranic life forms. We think that, well, the biggest living being at the moment is a blue whale, uh, but historically there were dinosaurs which were much bigger, but uh, they are not really the epitome uh, or the, the archetype of what life is in itself. Uh, instead, the, the, the scriptural image for life as concretized symbolically as an entity is the tree of paradise, which is the tree of Toba, that is the essence of life. Dar al akhir the next abode, Allah has said, is al hayawan the place of real life. That's where life, in its, in its miraculous, lively, dancing, luminous quality, its praising quality becomes perfect in, in, in the Jannah. Jannah is a garden. Gardens are about life. The other place is about the false life, which is about the fire. Once those two things are separated, the culmination, the highest point, as it were, of the paradise is, is the tree of, of Toba. So this is where Mevlana goes next. Tazagi wujun beshe toba yistin ham chujun beshaya khalqan nistin. The freshness and the swaying of the toba tree is thus. Tazagi wujun besh. Uh, yeah, that, that's what life is. He's, he's, as a brilliant poet, explaining, giving us language of life is not a kind of static thing. Life is about movement. There are some rather uninteresting lower plants and lichens that don't move about too much. But when we think of life, we think about movement. Lively means to move. So this is why he's using this language, toolbar tree, as moving and being fresh. The swaying of the living creatures are not thus. Why is that? Because we're still in this world where a kind of fiery death is mingled with the real life that is within us, and we're in this, this moribund, morgane state, kind of sleepy, not really grabbing the moment, as Mevlana would want us to. Um, but in the akhira, in the next world, there is the reality of the death that comes about from following the fiery ego. That's where you go if that's how you are. And similarly, in the divine justice, if you have worked for that which is light, beautiful, green, verdant, paradisal for the higher possibilities within yourself, for that sakina that comes when you've overcome the fiery, then you get to see the greatest biological entity, which is the, the Toba tree, which is Qur'anic and referred to um, recurrently in, in the Qur'an, and also the shade of the tree, or zillin mamdud, you know, the, the st stretched shade where the Qur'an speaks of that, it's alluding to, to this tree. Uh, those who believe and do right, pure, just things, Toba uh, is theirs, and an excellent place of return. We use this language of ma'ab and ma'ad a lot, don't we, when we speak of eschatology, and again this helps if we're looking at creation as a kind of circle almost, although it doesn't go around again. Still, this is kind of cyclical majesty about the way in which it's all been created. The two breaths at the beginning, the two blasts at the end, rahma at the beginning, rahma at the end, and a tree at the beginning and a tree at the end. And there's a lot of trees in Mevlana, and he does a lot with them. There's a lot of trees in the Quran. There's the olive tree, there's the palm tree, there's the tree of, of Toba. Um, and this uh, uh, amazing verse alam tara kayfa darab allah mathalan kalimatan tayyibatin asluha thabitun wa farquha fi as-samaa tu'ti ukulaha kullu hinin bi idhni rabbiha wa yadribu allah al-amthala lin-nas la'allahum yatadhakkarun suddenly this, this this verse comes have you not seen how allah strikes a likeness and a similitude and 
it's true we do not say that the realities described in scripture, particularly the afterlife things, are just metaphors. The Mottazalites thought that. They are realities, but Allah is still using this language of, of mathal. The fruits, again, you need trees, trees for fruits, uh, they are given them in likeness. An apple of this world is not a replica of the apple that will be in the next world. It's a kind of indication, an imperfect sign of the perfect archetypal form of that in, in the next world. So tree, the toba tree, and it is, there's some kind of connection between shajarat in tayyiba, a pure tree, and a pure word. So where does that take us? That takes us back to the initial principle of those two first things being creation and word. And the word preceding creation, again, the mind boggles when you think about how something can precede time itself, but this is what we mean by qidam. Um, and uh, at the end, there is also this, this tree. Um, and Mevlana does a lot with, with this. Um, and we can only look very, very briefly at it. Uh, the idea of a tree as being kind of cosmological uh, is universal and uh, ancient. Uh, the old Norse legends had the Yggdrasil, which is the cosmic tree. Um, the Aztecs had a cosmic tree. Um, the Tibetan Buddhists to this day have the, the world willow. Uh, it seems to be something universal, that there is something in creation which can be analogized to a tree. And when you think about it, it's actually a perfect image because it's about a kind of mirroring. What is a tree? Well, a tree is a kind of mirror, isn't it? Because it has an unseen dimension, the roots that go down into earth. And it also has branches that mirror that by going up into Asuman, into heaven. It's symmetrical. And uh, the trunk itself is a kind of axis. And it's the trunk that connects the two. So if you want a perfect metaphor or an image for that which is earthly and paradisal at the same time, which is also, of course, going to be your perfect image for uncreated divine speech that people can still understand and live by, then the tree is your perfect image. And, and that's why uh, Mevlana is talking about it here. This is the principle of life that is uniting dunya and akhira, the place that gives shade, and the place that bears fruits. So the Quranic ayah again says, it gives its fruits at every time with the permission of its Lord. And that's one reason why it's a metaphor for scripture. It's a metaphor also for the human heart, for the human soul. Uh, and it also indicates, because another thing trees do is that they kind of grow. So this takes us away from our model of creation as a kind of static thing, just being there um, like an asteroid and it doesn't change ever. Instead, it's a living, uh, breathing entity and has a kind of in, uh, teleology that leads on to the, the bearing of, of fruits. And the fruits in Rumi's system, the paradisal fruits, are just the, the nourishing uh, moments of the experience of the divine proximity, the divine love, and the divine closeness. Um, now, one of the things that the Mevlevis will say about their best known, certainly not the only, but their best known ritual uh, is that it has two things that are to do with vegetation. The famous Mevlevi instrument is the nai, the reed flute, which is made from something, it's not a tree, but it's something that is analogous to it. It's about life, it's a living thing. Uh, and also, uh, the turning, the devran, uh, represents the human being as, as khalifa, is the perfect, perfect human being between the two, because he's receiving rahmah from heaven with his right hand, dispensing it with his left hand on earth. So this is his basic movement. And the going around indicates his participation in the movements of the aflaq, the spheres, which we're all doing anyway, because our prayers, Ramadan, everything is connected to the movements of the spheres. We're all part of that, that cosmic dance. But the Mevlevi is kind of symbolically 
enacting that. And he is tree-like, living, and one part of him is in heaven, the other part of him is on earth. But uh, the tree receives from above, it's the water that nourishes it. And the tree then gives, as it were, to us from above, which is the fruits. So it's a one-way process, which is what prophecy itself is, what the saint is. The saint doesn't take anything. The holy prophet, Ali wasallam, didn't take anything. It just gives. Why? Because this hand, which is above, is the hand that takes from, from the infinite, from the world of, of placelessness, from, from Lama Khan. So this uh, image of the tree is important. And it's no coincidence that it's at the center of our art in Islam. Vegetal motifs arabesques, tessellations, there's kind of growths everywhere um, from the time that they designed the Dome of the Rock and the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus to the great mosques of Istanbul. Carpets tend to have trees, prayer carpets, often there'll be a tree there because the tree, it, it's the paradisal symbol of the fact that there can be a, a connection uh, between heaven and earth which provides fruit and which provides uh, shade and the worshipper is the one who wishes to be in, in the shade of Allah's Rahmah. That's what the Salat is asking for. Um, let me venture upon just one more briefly. There is, what, 11, 12, 15 verses altogether. So I should move a little bit faster. Gardar ofta dar zaminu asman zahra hashan abgard gardad dar zaman. Should it fall on earth or sky, their livers will turn to water at once. Uh, what's falling? Well, it's talking again about the uh, about the nafha, about the breath. Uh, and here he's talking about the other, the flip side of this effulgence. On the one hand, it produces the tree and it produces the fruit of the tree and it links heaven and earth and it makes us turn and it brings everything to life. But on the other hand, it uh, puts out uh, the fire uh, and seems to put us out because we think that we are our personalities, our individuality. What am I other than my personality, my memory, my individualism? Uh, take that away and what could possibly be left? So it's, it's frightening. The advent of al-haq uh, is beautiful but also fearsome. And again, human art has always known this and the apprehension of nature uh, and of beauty uh, has always been alert to the fact that human beings when confronted by beauty do not just have a loving for it and a longing for it and a sense of ease but there's also a fear this is the mysterium tremendum et fascinans it's, it's fascinating and entrancing but it's also terrifying so to see any of the signs of Allah's creation unless it's something that is kind of a small thing uh, that is not because of the nature of the relationality threatening like a baby rabbit or something it's not frightening as such uh, but generally the mazahir uh, kauniya Allah's manifestations in creation are magnificent but scary as well and in fact the bulk of them are scary uh, if you look through the Hubble Space Telescope most of the stuff that's out there is pretty overwhelming dwarfing us and we don't want to get anywhere near those x-ray stars and those supernovas and those colliding galaxies and those extremes of temperature there, there is a fear a knowledge of Allah's manifestation in the world alienates us and, and makes us afraid and also if you go down into the micro world and you look through an electron microscope or um, look at uh, some of the conclusions of the Large Hadron Collider, some of those other things, that's pretty scary stuff as well. What we're actually made up of is um, sort of supercharged particles moving sometimes randomly at gigantic speeds. There's, there's a way in which our humanness is alienated by our awareness of how we are totally part of, of, of creation. Uh, and what Mevlana is doing here is to say their livers will turn to water at once 
if you if you really see the, the the nature and the majesty of Allah's creation, you will be afraid. The liver is the seat of courage in traditional medicine, so you 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 become witless with fear, and it applies to the second of the two breaths as well. And this is where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is speaking of His book, and He says, "Lo anzalna هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله." If we sent this Qur'an down upon a mountain, you would see it terrified and split apart from the fear of Allah. Um, it's just a book. But there is a majesty in the book which is not just about the outward form of the, uh, the, the meanings, but is about its ontological power and weight. And one of the deepest things we do in Ramadan, of course, is to bathe in the word. And one reason why Taraweh is such an extraordinary, humbling, strengthening thing, once you have a humble uh, relationship to Allah's book, is that it gives you some sense of this, this jalal, this mysterium, tremendum. It's not a particularly consoling thing, it's a rigorous thing, and it makes you feel small, and that's um, exactly how we should feel, because um, that's, that's how we are. Um, so that's probably all we have time for this time. And you can see that already uh, Hazrat Mevlana has taken us on a long journey. And it's probably the case that uh, one reason why sometimes and Mullah Abdurrahman Jami and others have described the Masnavi as Qur'an Darzabani Farisi, uh, the Qur'an in the Persian language, is not because anybody's claimed prophecy or revelation or legislation or anything like that. No, it's talking about a number of things in the speech, one of which is that the sequence of its ideas is designed to enter the heart rather than just to gratify the mind, which is what books usually do. The sequence of ideas and rhythm, rhythmic patterns and moods in the Qur'an uh, is really difficult to understand if you're measuring it against a philosophy book or a medical textbook or a novel, it's strange. Uh, but it descended, um, the astral descent in pieces, on your heart. And the effectiveness of the text is to do with the heart's apprehension of the shattered jigsaw of our sense of ourselves and the world actually being pieced together at a very deep and really non-discursive level. The deepest things in the Qur'an are the things that wouldn't work in human speech. Sometimes you could say it's a little bit closer to music, although it's certainly not music. But remember he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, أُوْتِيْتُ مِزْمَارًا مِنْ مَزَامِيرِ آلِ Dawood. I've been given one of the pipes of David. David, according to the Book of Kings, used to play his pipe and dance in front of the, the tabot, in front of the Ark of the Covenant. So what is that? Uh, and a pipe doesn't say anything, it's just a sound. Well, uh, it's the sound itself, uh, and more precisely the kalam itself, the divine speech, in its unique i'ajaz, its syncopations, and its connections of ideas, works at a level that's deeper than poetry, deeper than music, deeper than any human cultural production, and brings about that alchemical transformation, which is why this is... Shahr al-Qur'an, the month of the Qur'an. Uh, and this is really why Abdurrahman Jami and others are saying that it's, a, it's kind of reminiscent of the Qur'an's approach because in these ghazals, even in the Masnavi, which is often storytelling and discursive, but certainly in, in the Divan Shamsi Tabriz, you can't see where he's going and you can't guess what's going to happen next. And he seems to combine 20, 30, 50 different poetic images in a single short uh, uh, ghazal or sequence of, of, of lines and, and it's troubling certainly to the western mind uh, it's troubling everything has to be lined up and linear and uh, open to scientific or literary analysis but this is from a different world this is from the world of the spirits and that I think is what they're talking about with the Masnavi that on the face of it, if you read a translation of these seven lines that we've done, he seems to be skipping around a whole range of diverse topics. But in reality, you can see, and this is where the commentaries are really useful, uh, that he's opening up certain things, but traveling across a metaphysical landscape that's already about interconnection. 
it's not about a kind of Newtonian model of different things happening in different places. This is a, a model in which everything is it's more like relativity. It all interacts with each other uh, at various uh, levels. Anyway, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us insight into his book and to have respect for those who have been granted this extraordinary blessing of having insight into his book uh, and whose hearts feasted upon his book morning and night and inshallah to make this a month in which we truly have the pages of Allah's book open to us. Wal-afu minkum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. malakutam مرغ باغ ملکوتم نیم از عالم خاک دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخته Ba-da-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-